six alloys the last time, and I showed you the uh, I showed you this that says there's different. You can have pure nickel, which we use for some applications, not many. Saws solution strengthened to give some strength because pure metals are usually pretty soft. And precipitation strengthened, which are these turbine blades and things like that. Difficult to weld, but sometimes we, we do need to weld them and repair them and stuff, so we do know how to weld them, and I'm going to talk about that today. And there's specialty alloys that I'm going to go through um, because they are specialty alloys. Um, we talked about these things are perfect for hot cracking, uh, solidification cracking, and I showed you pictures of, of some of that. And all these welding metallurgists of the 1950s and 60s and 70s developed all kinds of tests, and I talked about the Vera strength test, where you actually bend the metal while you're welding it, open up cracks, and then you look where the cracks form in the microstructure, and that's all good welding metal. But when you get to the, um, start adding certain things like aluminum, titanium, and niobium to your nickel, you form these very high melting intermetallics, and this is basically increasing aluminum, titanium, or or niobium, this is not a real microstructure, but you have essentially no carbides or very few small carbides over here, and you end up increasing the amount of carbides as you come across here, and then you also start increasing these precipitates, which are gamma prime precipitates, and they get larger and larger, and so they end up taking 90% of the volume, and those have melting points, if they were pure, of 2,000 degrees centigrade, the alloy itself, because it's got nickel in between, has a melting point of 1200 centigrade, but these get very high strength. They don't dissolve until about um, 1000 or 1100 centigrade, so you can get very high strength in these alloys at high temperatures, which is why we make them into turbine blades and things. <clears throat> Did I tell you what the value of 50 degrees Fahrenheit is in the operating temperature of an engine? It saves the commercial air. That all the commercial carriers, people from Boeing, if you can increase the operating temperature of that engine by 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll save two billion dollars a year in fuel costs for all the commercial airlines. So that's one of the reasons that we spend so much money on these super alloys. If you can get one that goes just 50 or 100 degrees higher in temperature, your efficiency of your engine goes way up. Okay, actually they go way up, but it goes up enough because they're burning a lot of fuel, <laughs> okay. Um, and the, uh, I mean, the Navy has similar problems. I worked uh, on a, uh, a recuperator for surface ships, and you guys can have recuperators now. You know what I'm talking about? So your exhaust stack, you got all these hot gases going out the top, if, if you're not a nuke, okay, you a carrier. But the carrier actually has the fuel for all the frigates and destroyers and cruisers and things like that, and it turns out because of the, when you're being deployed because you're concerned about the threat of a nuclear blast up in the atmosphere, um, you actually deploy for 100 miles or more, okay? So your, your, your small ships are out there 100 miles away from the carrier, and they have to come back to the carrier to refuel. The carrier can keep going for, what, 10 years or what, for eight before refueling. But the small ships, they burn diesel fuel and they got to come back. And it turns out they can spend 30% 30, 30 of their time just going off station to go get refueled. Okay? So you'd like to improve the efficiency of those engines. So they, uh, they had a program once between uh, well, Rolls Royce, it was where they were going to test it because they had a full size test facility. But they built something, a heating changer, about the size of this room that was going to take the hot gases coming out of the engine and preheat the air coming in. This is not when you're going at full speed, but 90% of the time you're not at full speed, okay? You're saving fuel by running lower, and your efficiency is low. If you could preheat the air coming in to combust it, you could save like 30 or 40% of your fuel. So they want to have a recuperator, which is just a big heat exchanger between your exhaust gases and your incoming air that you're going to burn in your engines, okay? So they, uh, I guess your engines now are turbines. So you yeah. don't use pistons anymore. They right? do that on the gas turbines. They do that. They've done it on the gas turbines yeah. for yes. So this is primarily for the turbines. Um, uh, the pistons have other problems. Uh, so.
So the class diesel do that? What was it called? Diesel or turbocharged or what it is? Yeah. It well, got the, you know, uh, so they 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 had this one billion dollar program, or I don't remember how big it was, and it was with I can't remember what aerospace company. Oh, it was Garrett, Garrett uh, turbines. Uh, so they designed this recuperator in Southern California. They built it, sent it to England to test it because they had a test facility to test something. They had a, a land-based turbine test facility that I mean, you couldn't just test it with a little jet engine. Okay, it just has to be a big turbine. Okay, so Rolls Royce had this. So this joint program, it was supposed to last for a hundred thousand hours. I bet I estimated it lasted for a hundred seconds. Okay, and. What happened, this was the early 90s, peace had broken out, and everybody was trying to save money, so they didn't do a full three-dimensional heat transfer model of the turbine, they did one-dimensional, and this is kind of, you know, why do we have these failures? Well, you skip on the engineering up front, and it turns out the thing just heated up non-uniformly and twisted like a pretzel. We're talking six-inch thick steel rods that held this thing together, okay? Twisted like a pretzel within two minutes. So I was on the review review board for this failure, and uh, um, uh, I remember calculating. It was something that back in the envelope calculation should have told them that you know you have to heat up slowly. But the Navy's requirement was you had to go from dead stop, you know, to producing steam and full startup of this of the turbine within two minutes. Well, the land-based turbines, which have been using recuperator technology for 10 or 15 years, they had a 30-minute start. They would keep slowly and help the thermal equilibrium. Well, the Navy didn't want to, didn't have that patience because when you got to go fast, you need power now. And so they built it to, you know, a standard that didn't work. Now, since then, they fixed it. Okay, this is now 20 years ago, late earlier. And I've been told that you have recuperators on your on your ships now, but they had to go back and re-engineer the whole thing. Okay, so we all have. It's yep. not just the Coast Guard that screws up. Preheating also uh, reduces your thermal signature, so when surface ships yeah. are trying to be seen. Yeah, you're still pretty. You still got a pretty good signature. Right. <laughs> you have to be a, a lot closer to. It's hard to find and hide something that. that big. <laughs> and yes, but instead of exhausting. 1200 degree Fahrenheit air, you're exhausting 900 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever, I don't know. But uh, there's still a lot of signature out there. So. Any, any high technology agency in uh, the country that can't find you know, a big piece of steel out in the middle of the ocean emitting hot gases, uh, really, you don't, you don't have to worry about fighting them. <laughs> if they can't find you, <laughs> it's not exactly a needle in a haystack. Okay, um, so if we look at these precipitation hardened aluminum uh, nickel alloys, they have traditionally, the gamma prime phase was traditionally aluminum, but then a guy, uh, well I know his son, who's a metallurgist uh, out in California, Larry Eiselstein, but Larry Eiselstein's dad in the 1950s in Huntington, West Virginia, invented Inconel 718. All the ones before that or some of these other alloys up here that were turbine alloys, and they were really considered almost impossible to weld. It's just difficult, but very difficult. You may have to preheat these things to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Talk about an oven, okay? You basically do this, you know, it has to be automated and everything else to weld these types of alloys. But they do weld them uh, in certain cases because the parts are so valuable you can't afford not to try to re re recoup it. Uh, by well repair. But Eiselstein found if you replace some of the aluminum with titanium, it's much easier to weld. And he developed the Inconel 718. Inconel 718 is almost like 304 stainless steel today for nickel based super alloys. Not for the turbine blades, but for the disc or the compressor parts of the engine. Things that have to go to, well, steel sort of poop out at like uh, 900 degrees centigrade or 800 degrees centigrade, you need to go to uh, 1800 Fahrenheit to 1000 centigrade or above, you need to get to some of the nickel based alloys. And Incan L718 is the workhorse, probably 40, 50, 60% by weight 
they have whole conferences just talking about inking of that one alloy on nickel-based super alloys because it is the workhorse alloy. And there's all kinds of variants on it, okay, to make it more machinable. When you don't need quite the temperature capability, various things. But um, that's one of the, that is the workhorse nickel-based super alloy. Not for the turbine blades. The turbine blades tend to be B1900 and uh, IN International Nickel 100. This is Martin Marium 200 as a cast super cobalt based alloy, as I remember. Uh, not, not bad, cobalt based, but Martin Marietta. Asteroid, I think, is a General Electric trade name. Rene is certainly a General Electric trade name. Inconel is International Nickel again. Uh, but anyway, the companies all kind of put their little trademarks on it. And usually, um, uh, these things are pretty well protected by patents for 20 years, which is uh, a good uh, good for the companies to develop them because you're not going to sell a million tons of these alloys, okay? you got to recoup your costs other ways. Uh, and there is a story, I, I showed you the uh, structure here. Um, in fact, there was a General Electric alloy called GTD-111, and it had this kind of very blocky, squarish uh, gamma prime precipitates, and it was a composition that was overlapped by lots of other things. General Electric developed it in the 1980s, and uh, early 1980s, and uh, they couldn't get a patent on composition. Um, because it overlapped too many other alloys that were out there. Uh, and they did apply for a patent on a heat treatment. And the patent office kept denying and kept denying it. In the late 1990s, when, when other people had decided this is a good alloy for land-based turbines, uh, and they had started using it because it didn't have a patent protection, and had incorporated it into their engine design, all of a sudden, 18 years after General Electric had announced this alloy and other people had adopted it, the Patent Office grants the patent. General Electric had been fighting it, you know, trying to pursue it for 18 years, and finally the Patent Office agrees, issues the patent, and everybody out there who's using the alloy has now got to pay royalties to General Electric. Well, it turns out if you buy something and pay full cost for or pay cost for you buy it um, on the open market, you essentially are buying patent rights to use that product. Not that alloy, but that particular turbine blade or whatever it is, right? That's part of the price. That's the monopoly price that you pay. Well, it turns out when I worked at the Naval Air Rework Facility, the overhaul time on a TF-30 uh, turbofan engine was 500 hours. It didn't work for very long before they had to come back for complete rebuilding. Well, today, on a commercial engine, that was a military engine, and I don't know what the overhaul time is on a military engine right now. I have been that close to the repair side of things in the last four years. But on a commercial engine, it's 30,000 hours. Okay? 30,000 hours is just, if you were running 24 hours a day, would be, and you are nearly that on a land-based turbine, which is generating electricity or something. Uh, is three or four years. So, um, but, and what happens to this structure metallurgically is we get something called coarsening. These little, you like these things to be very small, very square, but over time they coarsen and they become somewhat rounded and they become larger, maybe three or four or five times larger. And that's just the thing trying to go to a more equilibrium thermodynamic structure. And the question is, could one of these utilities go to a repair company, at the time I was working for Promoloy um, as a consultant, could they go and refurbish this blade? Now these blades have, I showed you, the internal cooling passages and things like that, so how can you do that? What type of heat treatment can you give it without turning into a pretzel? Well it turns out there is something called a hot isostatic pressing that was developed in the 1950s and it's still it's actually used more and more extensively. But you can take a casting, for example, 
uh, Harley Davidson uh, aluminum cylinder heads for their engines, uh, which are a critical component. Why are they a critical component? Because you're sitting right on top of it and it blows up and you get split in two. Okay. Um, but it's a ca aluminum casting. If you take a pressure vessel, this could be a pretty good sized pressure vessel, and you, you basically, I'm going to show one that I can talk about, it has end caps that are just screwed in. So it's just a, a big cylinder, and one of these things, one of these vessels blew up by, right up here in North Andover, sent, broke the whole thing in brittle fracture into 70 pieces, an average of five tons each. In the initial fracture, uh, this was uh, 17 inches thick up here. It was actually tapered uh, towards the center, and it was uh, 10 or 11 inches thick where the crack started. And they sent a 15-ton piece a quarter mile away, wow. which some of the neighbors in Andover were not so pleased with. No one it didn't land on anybody. Now, the guy who was operating it at 2 a.m. in the morning, because these things, it's a pretty expensive vessel, and you operate them fairly continuously, uh, you know, you put in a batch, take out a batch, but you don't shut it down. It takes, takes 24 hours to heat up and cool down, so you kind of run a batch a day. 2 o'clock in the morning, he's on the night shift, and he had just gotten up to change the chart paper, and he walked from down here to that chair over there to change the chart, chart paper. The thing blew up and landed the five-ton piece and crushed his chair. He was kind of out for a few days. He was, he was sort of nervous. That. Uh, but in any case, in a high-rise static press, if you put these castings in here on a rack, you introduce argon, gaseous argon, and you start heating it up, and the argon gets to pressures of 20,000 PSI. In fact, you can't even tell the argon liquid from the argon gas at those pressures. You know anything about the critical point of gases. You can't tell the difference. The, the atoms at that pressure are so close together, thermodynamically you cannot distinguish a liquid from a compressed gas. Okay? You can't really compress them any tighter than than that, okay? Uh, anyway, it had a brittle fracture, um, partially related to stress corrosion fracking, which is a hydrogen uh, corrosion problem. Actually, this is not a bad story for metallurgy in general. Maybe I'll tell you the whole story. But anyway, it blew up. But when you put the parts in here, they don't change shape. It's isostatic. The pressure is the same from all directions. So you put in a part that's shaped like a cylinder head, or you put in a part that's shaped like a turbine disc, and you can squeeze all the pores out at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit is the operating temperature. And the, the metal becomes slightly plastic, and you put it in here and hold it there for 8 or 10 hours, and you essentially forge without deforming the shape of the part. It's like forging it to get rid of all the internal defects. Turns out we showed, actually it was a Greek Air Force student, Okay, uh, who was doing this? Um, that we showed that we could re rejuvenate and get the original microstructure because we're taking it up to 2,000 degrees, dissolving all that stuff, the gamma prime, in the nickel matrix. And then, if you cool it down at the right rate, you get the original microstructure that you wanted back. And so, it turns out we could rejuvenate the GT111 blades. And these blades can be this size on a commercial turbine, okay? They're not small, they might be $25,000 a piece. So there's a fair value with not having to pay general electric a royalty. Okay. And you get another 30,000 hours with these four or five years, and eventually that patent runs out, okay? But this actually may be in some of my other talks, but this is not a bad one to tie together the metallurgy. Uh, remember we had the, the three circles? Whether you're talking stress corrosion cracking or whether you're talking hydrogen embrittlement, you have a microstructure, you have a stress, and you have um, a corrosive medium. With hydrogen embrittlement, it's hydrogen. The microstructure here, well, this forging, this. <coughs> This big cylindrical tube, if you will, weighed 200 tons. The end caps weighed 25 tons a piece. The vessel was a 250 ton vessel. 
approximately 10 inches thick. I think the end caps were 22 inches thick. Okay, and it was just screwed together. In the mid-1980s, when they designed this, they did it on a supercomputer, which would probably not be as strong as your laptop today, but they did a big finite element model, and they did it for steady state operating conditions, just like the Navy did for their recuperator, okay? Sort of. You don't want to go to some big, uh, expensive computer program with three dimensions. And they certainly didn't do transient startups, just like they didn't get the recuperator transient startup of eating correct. So I got a call, I remember this was the late 90s, I was in apartment and I remember being in that office when this happened. And I go up there two days afterwards and I mean they just, the, the building had been blown apart like it had been a hurricane, you know, just had the structural steel remaining and all the walls, you know, had been blown out. And you can see the Harley Davidson pistons sitting on racks, you know, ready to be heat treated and stuff. Uh, and, and other components sitting in the building. And it turns out, uh, tra uh, Travelers Insurance had hired me to help with the analysis, and John McNicky, head of Travelers Research Lab, and I were the first two in the basket that went down in the pit where the thing had blown apart and uh, to look at it. But I remember coming back and telling the, our administrative officer, I went in and said, Joe, beware of the transient thermal stresses. Because I just done some back of the envelope calculations that basically said fracture mechanics said that, well, first of all, the outside in a general normal operating condition should be in compression. I mean, everything else is in tension, but it's hot on the inside, it should be compressive on the outside. Except in the transient condition, you use like the residual stresses during welding, the stresses flip. And so it turns out, let me show the real. The real sidewall was tapered like this. So here's the center line over here. And this is where the crack started, a uh, stress concentration, right? But, and then they had the threaded caps in here. And this was 17 inches thick, this was only 11 inches thick. So it was the thinnest part, it was also a stress concentration. And if you start thinking about it, it occurred after 30 minutes, okay? when they were starting up, or maybe two hours, I don't remember. I could go back and calculate it, because I did the calculation by a technique that you'll learn in the, the other things, where you take complex heat flow equations and you reduce it down to the Einstein equation. I already told you that the distance that something travels is the square root of alpha t, where alpha is the thermal diffusivity. Thermal diffusivity of steel, I know, I've been using it for years, is a tenth of a centimeter squared per second, I know what the thickness of this was. I plugged in, and lo and behold, the time was about 75% of the heat up time. Okay, they were in the transient region still, and then I started just thinking about how the stresses could be patterned in here. They had tensile stresses here. They had never analyzed the transient condition. They had analyzed the inside surface for tensile stresses in steady state operation, but they never analyzed the outside surface where you would get tensile stresses on the startup. So I came back and said, Joe, beware of the transient thermal stresses. I knew it was the transient thermal stresses contributed to this. Well, later on we found out, well, the steel wasn't quite up to spec. Okay? When I already talked to you about renormalizing of the plate of the, the <laughs> LNG vessels and how Bethlehem had an average of like 20.5 foot pounds, okay? And they would take the very best plate and cut it up and make all their test plates out of that. Well, when you make a big forging like this, you can't go cutting pieces out of a big piece of steel like this. So they take up what they call a prolongation. And the forging actually has a little end on it that you're supposed to cut out and make all your test specimens so you know what the properties of the steel are. Okay? Well, Japan Steel Works have done that. Okay? They've taken their prolongation. And they measured the, the fracture toughness as a sharpie. It's not exactly a fracture toughness, but it's a surrogate for fracture toughness. And it flunked. So you're allowed an extra heat treatment. You can put it back in and heat treat it, except you have no prolongation to cut off for testing. So they just put a chunk of seal in with the furnace, a smaller piece, you know, maybe something like this, rather than something that, like, 
this, you know, weigh 200 tons. And they put it in the furnace, and believe it or not, the smaller pieces cool at a faster rate than the great big 200 ton piece. And they cast on that extra little piece, whereas the original one that was cooling at the same rate didn't pass. And so, but they, they passed their, their surrogate, and they said, okay, passes. This is just like the Coast Guard using the best plates to get the best properties in your test, and passing your test and saying, we got good material in our product. Well, maybe not. Okay, afterwards, we tested, the only hot, hot zone of the furnace is basically around here. We actually tested up in here after the failure, and we found it had lousy properties. It would have flunked. Okay? And this part had never been overheated. You talk about this was 17 inches thick and 22 inches. This was far enough away. You never got the heat during a 24-hour cycle up here to change the structure of this steel. This was the original properties of, of the forging. And we found if they had actually, if they could have taken the sample from that location, they would have found that it flunked too. And they would have had to scrap the 200 ton forging. But they didn't, they put it in service. So they had high stresses from the transient thermal stresses. They had high micro, uh, poor microstructure from a poor heat treatment, whatever, okay? And it turns out the Croton, they had Nauco, which at the time was a French company, now is headquarters in Naperville, Illinois, and has been purchased by another company. But they are the largest uh, water treatment people in the world. So they go into utility plants, and just like the Navy nuclear folks, you guys know more about water chemistry and how to control it than just about anybody in the world. And generally, you do <laughs> control it. Well, not everybody controls it so well. They were using some molybdenum oxide inhibitors in the water for corrosion protection, and it turns out it pitted the, the steel. They didn't know it because the whole thing was water cooled in an outside jacket here, and water was in here, and no one went in to look, but when, we, when the thing blew up, he saw the surface look like 101 Dalmatians with all the corrosion bits, okay? Well, corrosion like that produces hydrogen, okay? So it was a form of hydrogen improvement, stress corrosion bracket, call, you call it whatever you want. The thing had been designed as a leak before break. What you'd like, and what you have on a nuclear submarine, a pressure vessel, you have such that the critical flaw size is greater than the thickness of the steel. So if you get a crack, and it starts to grow, you will see a leak before the thing explodes. Okay, that com comforting to know that NAFC has chosen a good enough steel that it will leak and you'll have, you know, 1,000 PSI water, whatever, shooting in. And you know, you take some duct tape, put it over, whatever. Right, whatever you guys do on a submarine. Okay. Those 10 you need to have a <laughs> Or you go closer to the surface. <laughs> the pressure goes down. But if you have a wall leak on the pressure vessel, you want to design it as a leak before break. And I did a rough calculation. If this thing had the proper fracture toughness, like they thought they were getting, and, and it, um, even with the, the transient thermal stresses, it should have leaked before it break, broke. In fact, when we actually got that 16-ton piece and found the original crack site, the critical flaw size was half an inch, not 11 inches. Okay? Because the hydrogen had reduced the fracture toughness. The bad microstructure had reduced the fracture toughness. Each one of these circles, all three of them, were bigger than they were supposed to be. Transient stresses, bad heat treatment, and corroding. And they ended up being in the circle overlap there. In theory, it had been designed properly if you could never have thermal if you never had to start it up. <laughs> okay. But you do have to kind of start the thing up every day. Uh, but anyway, it's a good story of how all the metallurgy comes together and all three of them interact to blow up something. And it, it didn't land in someone's lawn. I think that person would have, you know, 16 ton piece landed in their lawn a quarter mile. Just a divot in the grass. <laughs> I'm just curious, you said you worked for an insurance company. 
they find someone liable? It sounds like all of them. Oh, they found all of them liable. Okay. okay. But it's that I have been, I was turned out to be a fact witness. I was there on the initial investigation before any lawsuit had been filed. So I ended up not being involved in the lawsuit because they could have deposed me as a fact witness if they had named me as an expert in the litigation. So Professor Latanison here, who was a corrosion expert, he became the, the MIT expert on the litigation side of this. And they did, it went on for seven or eight years before they finally, you know, people settled out. It never, I don't think it went to trial. But, you know, people were settling. I don't, well, I think initially they estimated a $40 million loss. I think I heard numbers of over $60 million before it was all done. Okay. But, yeah, the insurance companies just get together. Oh, well, there's another another problem, which is sort of interesting, which has nothing to do with this course. And I, well, we're done so for today. But, but I'll tell you that part of it. So this is one of the only times I ever, I had to go down to Travelers to uh, uh, discuss with the the underwriters. Usually I don't deal with the underwriters. The underwriters are the guys who wrote the insurance originally. This is not your standard homeowner's policy, okay? But this, there's, historically, there's something in the commercial world. There's Hartford Steam Boiler. You've heard about, probably heard their name before. They, they insure pressure vessels around the world, out of Hartford, Connecticut. And they have a policy that insures against um, uh, mechanical damage to pressure vessels and heavy machinery, okay? They do not insure against explosions, okay? But there's something that came along after Hartford Steam Boiler in the 1860s or whatever called an all-risk policy. This is sort of like your comprehensive on your automobile. You got your collision and you got your comprehensive. And the two of them together sort of mesh together so if anything bad, if you have both types of insurance, the two of them will take care of things. Okay. Well, they have boiler machinery and they have all risk, and the two of them are supposed to mesh together perfectly. So whenever you have a loss, it's going to be covered by one or the other. Except the brokers who are selling this multi-million dollar policy decided to let Hartford Steam Boiler change their policy so it didn't quite mesh. One of the things was missing. And it was the one that this one fell under. So we went down to meet with the traveler's underwriter, and he says, uh, I'm sitting in this meeting with all these other business people, and I was supposed to answer any technical questions. And uh, there weren't really that many technical questions. But they basically pointed out that technically, according to the policy, there was no insurance company for the company. Because Hartford had unilaterally changed their policy and the broker who sold it didn't notice the change, and they were going to put the brokerage company, which is a multi-million dollar financial firm, on no a multi-billion dollar financial firm, on notice for effectively selling a contract that didn't include complete coverage, okay? So anyway, I don't know what happened with that. I won't name the, on video, I won't name the name of the big financial company that was potentially on the hook, but they did send a letter to the chairman of the board and president of that big company saying, oh, by the way, you may be liable <laughs> because you let Hartford rewrite their policy and excluded this one area that had tra traditionally been covered. But to travelers, I'll say something good about travelers, the head underwriter at Travelers says, it doesn't matter, we are going to pay for this loss and so the company will be made whole and we'll find out with Hartford and the big financial broker later. Okay? It wasn't the company's fault that this broker screwed up. Okay? And so what happened to that? I mean, I, I was out of it because I was a fact witness. I'd been in the hole. You know, I was one of the first two people in the hole. And they didn't want to put me forward as, you know, the mechanic who had investigated the failure because they thought I might go a little further afield with my expertise. Okay? And they didn't want to tell the other side what all the theories were. So I, you know, I got a couple of days consulting out of it. Probably got a week's consulting out of it. But uh, I didn't finish it, and I can't tell you all the story. But it's, it's a good story from the metallurgy point of view. It's also a good story from the business point of view. Um, um, make sure you know what's in your insurance policy and what's excluded. Okay?
So we got two presentations tomorrow, and we will start aluminum. We did finish nickel today. Or, yeah.